Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Sumaya, for that beautiful introduction. And I also thank you, Ms. Medina, also, uh, for your beautiful statements also. And I do want to congratulate all of the honorees from your organization uh, for their philanthropy and for their giving. And, you know, you, you really touched on a really important issue about making sure that our community, under people understand that they have power. You know, in, in my organizing that I do, and I'm very fortunate that I learned uh, to do the grassroots organizing, uh, to teach ordinary people that they have power and that, that and they can use their power. And that doesn't mean that they don't have to have a high school education. They don't have to learn how to speak perfect English. They may not even yet be citizens, but the fact that they have power. And when we see that now our Latino population is, is so immense, you might say, in our country right now, they say that 50% of the United States of America right now are people of color. And, and we know among that group that Latinos, we are probably the, the largest group. But the, so what we have, uh, the kind of influence that we have to uh, use in our country right now is absolutely crucial because of all of the issues that you, you just outlined and the things that are coming down the pike in terms of uh, the challenges uh, uh, not only for our community, uh, but you might say the attacks on the Latino community. So it's really super important that we organize uh, uh, in, in order to make our influence felt uh, and in a uh, civic action type of way with by voting and getting involved. But also uh, the other part of that, as you mentioned, is to be able to raise the money to do the work that we have to do. I know uh, in, in my work with uh, in the past, uh, way back when the first organization I belonged to was a group called the Community, Community Service Organization. And we passed a lot of really important laws in the state of California. We got rid of deputy registrars to register to vote. Uh, we passed a one really important law that I want to mention, and that is that uh, people who were not yet uh, citizens but were legal immigrants in our country could get public assistance. That meant aid, aid to the old, aid to the disabled, aid to needy children. And right now we probably have over 15 million Latinos in the United States that are covered by that law, a very, very important law. So we know that we can flex our power uh, to, uh, to pass the policies that we need. And as all of you may know that in California, uh, as of next year, all undocumented people in California will have access uh, to our uh, health care system, okay? Our covered California health care system. And that is a really big issue. And of course, we only got that because we we're able to elect Latinos to our state legislatures to make sure that those laws pass. But again, to counter this, uh, uh, this, this uh, idea that somehow we Latinos don't know how to give is, is very important. Uh, I wanted to give a couple of examples. Way back, as I mentioned, with, with that organization, the CSO, uh, uh, I remember going to a conference once, and we had to reach out to other people uh, to pass that law, people uh, in the Jewish community and other places. I remember going to a meeting and having, uh, as they introduced each organization, it was a coalition of a federation of Jewish organizations. After they introduced themselves, they all said how much money they had raised for the organization. I mean, that was a given. And I remember one of the speakers, and this was a group from Israel, and they apologized because they had not raised the amount of money that they had set in their goal. And I thought, what, what a great idea to understand that, yes, we have to do the organizing work, but you also have, also have to think of how much money you are raising to make sure that your organization's goals are met. This has got to be part of it. So it's not just organizing people on the ground like we do uh, to get them involved, but to, to make them understand that they also have to do part of the fundraising. In the United Farm Workers, uh, uh, in the United Farm Workers, I remember when we went out on the boycott, uh, we sent farm workers to New York City, uh, to Chicago, to Texas, to Canada, uh, and, and every group that went out there, they had to raise not only enough money to sustain themselves, 
while they were out there asking people not to buy grapes, you know, and doing the work that they had to do, the organizing work. But they had to raise enough money to send back to California because we had a lot of people on strike. And all of the people that were on strike, uh, they had to have money to have uh, a food to sustain themselves and to pay the rents of their homes. So every group that was out there, you had two jobs. You had to stop people, ask people to stop eating grapes, but you also had to raise enough money uh, to sustain your group wherever you were at and then send money back to California for the strikers that were not working. And and I remember one of our organizers, it, it, some of you may have known of him, his name is Eliseo Medina. I don't know whether he's related or not, but Eliseo used to say to the workers, when we go out there and we speak to the public, we're just not going to say, uh, you know, hello, nice to meet you, but we're going to have our hand out like this, okay? We're going to have our hand out like this so people know that we're asking them to also give to our organization yeah, to make sure that we can sustain our cause and to get the farm workers the justice that they deserve, you know, because at that point in time, as you know, farm workers were working from, from uh, dawn to, to dusk. Uh, they were getting horrible treatment. They didn't have bathrooms in the fields. They didn't have cold drinking water. They didn't have rest periods. They didn't have the right to uh, organize into a union. And it worked. It worked. Every single group was able to raise enough money, for, as I said, for themselves, to sustain themselves in the cities, but also to send back to Delano, California, for the farm workers that were on strike. And so we know that our people, uh, once that they understand that, that they have that power to raise money, that they actually that they can actually make it happen. And, you know, there was kind of a stigma, I think, Oftentimes in our community, when people don't want to talk about money, like it's something, you know, something we should be talking about, you know, and, and, and to say it's okay to talk about money because money is, sustains us and it's kind of our lifeblood uh, to be able to keep our, our organizations alive and keep our organizations going. Girl, my own mother, my mother's name was Alicia St. John Chavez, and she was a philanthropist in her own right. She was a businesswoman. She supported all of the local organizations uh, from the profits of, of, of the business, you know, funding them and helping them do whatever work they needed to do in the community. When my mother passed away, the church was so filled, you would have thought that the mayor had died. And, and when people were coming up to me and telling me, your mother did this, your mother helped me buy my house. What? Your mother sent my daughter to Girl Scout camp every year. And, and your mother helped me start our business. You know, uh, every people, people that were coming up to me and telling me all of these philanthropic things that my mother had done for them, that I had no clue. She never talked about it. She never talked about it. She just went out there and did the work. She, you know, made it happen. So uh, we have to kind of internalize that belief that part of the power that we have as Latinos is not, as I said before, organizing everybody to come and join our cause, but thinking about how we are going to sustain our organization and what are the techniques that we have to learn uh, to make sure that we have power, that we can use, we can finance the power and how to use that power and the financially. I wanted to give another example. So when we started the United Farm Workers Union, Cesar Chavez and myself, um, we really had, didn't have any money. I think Cesar had $7,000 in his bank account. And actually it was his brother Richard that really helped us finance the organization initially, okay? So what we did is, is we started a term life insurance program for the farm workers. So, if farm workers were only earning 70 cents an hour, 70 cents an hour, that's what, that's what their, their wages were. So we started a term life insurance and we had the workers pay $3.50 a month, every farm worker that we organized. And half of that money went to the term life insurance and the other half went to, for us to, uh, to, to be able to finance our organizing. And it worked, you know, it worked. And I remember it was very painful for myself 
to go to, you can imagine this, going to a farmworker's home and saying to them, okay, it's time for you to pay your dues, your 350 a month. Now that 350 a month in today's, in today's money would be worth about $40 a month, you know? And, uh, and I'm thinking that $3.50 a month, that would buy a dozen eggs, probably a pack of tortillas, a sack of potatoes, you know, a gallon of milk. But I'm asking them to give me that money so that we can organize a union so that they will be able to get out of the miserable condition that they're in. And I remember saying to Caesar, Caesar, this is so painful for me to ask them to give this money. And he said, remember this, if they do not pay this money, if they do not support the organizing, their conditions will never change. Their conditions will never change. They have to understand that they are the ones that, that have to organize, support themselves, support the organization, support the union, so that we can finally change conditions for farm workers. And it worked. And it worked. And I think this is it, that we have to take the responsibility for our community. And we have to say to our community, you have to be responsible. You know, uh, all of these uh, terrible threats that our communities are receiving right now, and, and people that want to put people, put, put the uh, immigrants in encampments, you know, like, like uh, concentration camps, like they did the Japanese during uh, the World War II. Uh, this is kind of the future that some people want for our people, you know. And so we have to say, but we're going to organize and we're going to build our, our walls to make sure that this does not happen. There are enough of, of, enough of us in all of these states that we can make a difference. And um, I know that uh, at Somos El Poder, that uh, I have had conversations that you're also looking at Texas. And uh, I have an obsession with Texas. Here in Texas, over 50% of our population in Texas is Latino. Over 50%. And yet we have laws that are being passed the, like they did here in California, Prop 187, uh, to try to punish Latinos because they uh, help someone that is undocumented. You know, this kind of, uh, you know, so the, the, so the fire in California that made people get, get busy and start organizing. And so, you know, we have a very different state in California when Pete Wilson was the governor and supported all of these legislative acts against Latinos, taking away our affirmative action, et cetera, and wanting to punish people because they wanted to help somebody who was an undocumented immigrant. Well, you know, we got together and we changed it. And we know that people in Texas can do that also, but we've got to make them understand that they have the power to organize, that they have the power to vote, and that they have the power to raise the necessary funds that they need uh, to sustain their growth. So we have a great challenge. And it's not just about Latinos. I know we're talking about Latinos right now. It's about, as you mentioned, Mr. Zumaya, it's about democracy. It's about stopping the fascism. And when sometimes people don't know what that word means. The word fascism is a word that means to hurt people and to punish people. And this is the one thing that we do not need or do not want in our democracy. We want to help people. We want to help people grow. We want to help them get their careers. So, and even if they are poor, that they have to understand that they also can participate and they can make sure that this will not happen. So we have a lot of great work to do. And I know that we uh, are in the position to do it. And I do want to uh, congratulate your organization, number one, for taking up this important cause. Because, you know, the one thing we do not want our people to always be dependent, be dependent on grants uh, from, from government, etc. But you, the business people, are really showing us the way that we have to do this. It, it's incumbent upon, upon us that we have to raise the money to pay for the work that we do and not to be ashamed and, and, or shy uh, as Eliseo Medina said before, put your hand out like this, okay? Not like this, like this. Don't be afraid to ask. Don't be afraid to ask and don't be afraid to give. And, and, and I guess that 
It's more than that. We have to have a responsibility to give. Mm. We have a responsibility, regardless of how poor people are, uh, they can give something. Like those farm workers earning, you know, 70 cents an hour were able to give 350 a month uh, to pay their dues to build uh, the United Farm Workers of America.